Hey guys, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. And before we get started today, I just wanted to let you know at the end of this video, I will have more information on the merch, ways that you can start ordering. I should have the first batch of the calendars in next week and be able to start shipping by the mid to end of week. So if you're interested, stay tuned to the end of the video. I'll have that all that information. I did had to did have to recalculate because I wasn't familiar with like how the taxes and all that stuff work but and i am still working on a few other things so if you guys have any more suggestions for merch i'm all ears and like i said there'll be some more things coming out as well In today's case takes us down to virginia my home state of virginia and more so to the southern eastern part of virginia down in the mountains and near near the roanoke area more specifically which is a beautiful area it's very uh, scenic there's you're very close to the appalachian trail and today we're going to be talking about the, the case of Christopher Douthat, but he went by Chris, so we'll be just calling him Chris in this video. Chris went missing on October 25th of 2013. He was 24 years old at the time. Chris has blue eyes and brown hair. He's roughly 5'8 to 5'9 and about 170 to, 100 to 200 pounds. He has a tribal band tattoo on his right bicep. He was known to smoke, smoke marble red shorts or LMN red short cigarettes. Chris is right-handed. When he went missing, he was wearing a dark gray hooded sweatshirt with a Snap-on Tools logo on the front, khaki pants, white shoes, and a brown baseball cap. It is noteworthy that Chris had just ended the relationship that he was having with his uh, live-in girlfriend and they were actually fighting over the custody of his daughter. He had had a, the, the daughter had a twin brother and they were young kids, like young infants, and the, the brother had died of something when he was very young, but the daughter was still alive, alive and they were fighting over custody of that daughter and the, the girlfriend had taken out uh, an order of protection against Chris. Again, I'm not sure why of the details, but just three days before he disappeared, he was supposed to be in a court hearing regarding that matter. So definitely very suspicious. Now let's look at the timeline of events leading up to his disappearance. According to Chris's mom, she had taken him to work that morning and she said that on the way to work, they were laughing and singing to the radio and just having a, a good a good time. You know, it was an, a normal average everyday day for them. She said that Chris was in a good mood and they just talked about some things about, you know, his relationship and what he was going to do that day. And all in all, she, he was happy and they got to uh, Vinton Roofing, which is where he worked. And they arrived there between 6.30 a.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. She dropped him off and then from Vinton Roofing, him and his work group, they went to the Ashley Plantation, which is pictured here. It's just a, looks like it's a country club that they were doing a roofing job at. And that was, they got there at roughly, let's say an hour later. Then at around 11.30 to 12 p.m., they broke for lunch and he stayed on the job site for lunch and just hung out with one of his buddies apparently. And that day, right after lunch around 1.30 is when work ended for the day. So that's when he left the job site. So according to co-workers, he and a co-worker and a co-worker's family member, they went back to Vinton Roofing from the job site, which was about a 25 minute ride and to pick up his paycheck. From there, they went from the Vinton Roofing to the Kroger grocery store, which is also located in Vinton, and apparently they arrived there at roughly 3.19 p.m. He was just, all he was doing at the grocery store was cashing his paycheck, I believe, which is a little odd, but I guess that's what some people do. And I know that they have those service desks where you can do that kind of thing, so I guess that's... that's. And then after that, he got dropped off in the area of Chaps Tavern, and this was around 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Chaps Tavern is a local hangout bar restaurant that a lot of people like to go to and Chris hung out here apparently often and it was one of his spots that he enjoyed. So this is where things get a little confusing. So apparently at 4.12 p.m. Chris made a phone call and then at 4.14 p.m. he made another phone call. Then at 4.22 p.m. he received a phone call from a woman that he was apparently supposed to meet. He called the woman that he was supposed to meet again at 525 and during that phone call he describes his location as the intersection of Garden City Boulevard and Riverland Road which I'm going to put a picture and a map up and if you look at this 
This would be roughly six minutes of a drive from where he was at the Chaps Tavern, but if you were to walk it, it would be roughly an hour. Now, according to the special agent that was working, working this case, Christopher took the 9th Street route to get from the area of Chaps Tavern to the intersection of Garden City Bay, Garden City Boulevard, and Riverland. How he knows that, I'm not sure, because one thing to note here that because it was 2013 and because Christopher apparently was using either a flip phone or a slide phone, it wasn't a smartphone, they were unable to get the kind of GPS data that we we're able to get today. Getting back to his phone call, he was set to meet his friend at the food line on Bennington Street in Southeast. Southeast. He was on his way there and apparently he was on the phone with her and he, his last words to her, he said like, Something along the lines was, somebody I know is walking by here and I'm going to go talk to them for a minute and I'll see you there later at uh, around 5 p.m. Well, anyway, his friend got there. She got there a little after 5 p.m. He was not there. She tried texting him. She tried calling him. There was just no trace of him and he's never been seen since, unfortunately. And that's really the timeline of events that led up to his disappearance. Of course, unfortunately, in cases like this, there's always discrepancies. You know, people have reported that you know, other patrons from Chaps Tavern recalled that he stayed at the bar until 8 p.m. that night and left on foot. And unfortunately, he wasn't reported missing for several weeks after his disappearance, roughly around, you know, the time of Halloween. And since his disappearance, there's been no activity on his bank accounts or social security, anything like that. Nine months before Douthat's disappearance, he and his live-in girlfriend, who was pregnant at the time, they were assaulted by an acquaintance who broke into their home, which was located on Kingston Road. And they were living with uh, Chris's brother at the time. Anyway, Douthat and his girlfriend sustained cuts and bruises in the attack and he testified at the trial of one of the assailants however he and that assailant was found guilty but the trial for the other assailant hadn't yet happened it was supposed to happen after the doubt that had disappeared so it's just a little suspicious that that occurred now that it is noteworthy that the second suspect was later also tried and found guilty and they don't think it has any you know relation to this case but it's always a possibility you know it's just very suspicious Chris did have some prior run-ins with the law, but nothing serious, just did a little hell raising when he was a kid, and, you know, but for the most part, he was, you know, he had cleaned up his life, he was doing great, he had a family, he had, he had a daughter who he adored, and was very close to and protective over, so, you know, he had a lot to going for him. He had a job that he loved, and I think that the custody battle over the daughter probably has more to do with his disappearance than anything else. I don't know, just an experience from researching these cases. And unfortunately, oftentimes, you know, when people go missing or someone gets murdered, it's often if someone that knows them. The statistics are crazy. It's like you're like 90% more likely to get hurt by someone you know than a stranger, which is really sad. But according to Chris's mom, you know, he loved life. He loved fishing. He loved hunting. You know, he adored his daughter. And his mother believes that, you know, his personal problems wouldn't have caused him to abandon his family. She does believe that, you know, there was foul play involved, and I agree. I mean, I think that most likely maybe that person that he ran into on the street, you know, did something to him. Maybe they went out and drank together and got into an argument. I mean, it's just, you know, who knows? Maybe it was a friend of, the, of his ex that was, you know, tried to get rid of him because of the custody battle. I mean, those things can get really ugly, and it's it's sad. Unfortunately, this case still remains unsolved to this day. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Chris Douthat, please call the Virginia State Police at 540-375-9589. Even though this case is eight years old, it still remains an open, active investigation. The authorities have put up different billboards around town. And according to the investigators, the Virginia State Police, they have gotten many leads off of these billboards and various tips. And based on what they say, they have interviewed over 40 people and they do have ver various persons of interest and they're just working to gather more information so that they can proceed. So hopefully in time, this case will be solved and Chris will be brought home to his family and they'll get the justice and closure that they so desperately want and deserve. 
My thoughts and prayers go out to Chris, his family and friends, and everyone who's working so hard to bring him home. I want to thank everybody for watching, as always, and please keep the comments respectful if you choose to leave them. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music, and I will see everyone in the next one. Take care. Alright guys, well, as always, thanks for sticking with me to the end. So, I should have the first batch of calendars in next week, and it looks like it's going to be altogether around $15. That's with shipping, the calendar, you know, the packaging, the tax, and all that. So, what I'll do is, next week when they come in, I'll let everyone know, and if you want one, you'll just have to send me an email or click the link for my PayPal account and send the $15 with your shipping address, and I'll start getting those out. And I am working on several other different merch ideas. Uh, one is a coffee mug and a few other things. So if you guys have any other ideas, please let me know. All right, see you next time.